this is Auteur Detour, wherein three film lovers travel through the filmographies of cinema's most important directors in hopes of finding a greater understanding on the other side. Hello and welcome to Auteur Detour. I'm Ian Hinckley. I'm here with Chris Balaza hey and Travis White. Hi. We are three friends <laughs> that uh, love movies. We've talked about movies for years together. Uh, and we kind of wanted to start this podcast to get into some of our favorite directors, film by film, and figure out what they're all about. And this first series we're doing is on the Coen brothers, which we're up to Miller's Crossing. So, Travis, I think I know the answer to this, but what did you think of Miller's Crossing? <laughs> well... <laughs> If I could speak on record, uh, <laughs> I don't love it. Uh, I think it's a you know a really amazing piece of writing. I think um, there's a lot to to like about it in terms of uh, everything from the production design to the acting, the performances. Um, but it leaves me emotionally cold, and uh, yeah, it's not a movie that I like. I always love watching it. It's like a fun time, but then it kind of just like goes out of my mind the second it ends. Um, yeah, but I'm, I, yeah, I'm interested to hear what you guys think. Yeah. Uh, so if I, I mentioned it last week, but Miller's Crossing is actually one of the few Coen brother films I hadn't actually seen before. So I just watched it for the first time and the first 15, 20 minutes I'm searching for like, who's the main character? Who am I supposed to identify with? Who's the guy, you know, what's the soul of this movie? Cause Gabriel Byrne seems like he's the lead and I'm like, is, am I following this guy the whole movie? Almost in the same way I follow like a, a like a Stanley Kubrick main character to a degree. Like they're kept at an arm's length, if you will. So it took me a minute to kind of warm up to the film. Then it was over. And as usual, there's all the great Cohen twists and you have to kind of stay on your toes and really pay attention to what's going on. Didn't love it the first time I watched it or the after I you know, finished it, slept on it. And I thought more about what I'd seen and what was going on in terms of the story. And uh, it really grew on me from there. Uh, not one of my favorite Coens, but definitely not one of my least. I really enjoyed the, um, uh, again, the thinking about it after all of the the twists and stuff had played out. Yeah, that's funny because you guys have the sort of evolution of this movie culturally, like between you. Because yeah. when it came out, People did, you know, Ebert especially, and everybody sort of had this review that it was all style, no substance. It wasn't, you know, special. But then over the years, it's grown on everybody to become, you know, it was named one of the Times 100 Best Movies of the Century. Like, it's it's a classic. And for me, it's one of my favorite Coen Brothers movies. Like, I had forgotten because... It had been a few years since I'd seen it. And when I first saw it as a kid, I didn't, I wasn't able to like um, fully get on board with how immoral every character is and how there's no, you know, there's, it's, the theme is very vague, especially to a young person, especially in 1990. So like, I didn't uh, really, I mean, you know, I loved the lines, like the famous lines. I loved the, big set pieces, but I was never, you know, on board with it until I was a teenager and then I loved it. And then I kind of forgot about it until this last watch about how good it was. And I got so much more out of it. I think that like, it may be their most, um, I don't know, not their most thoughtful piece, but it's, it, to me, it cares more about saying something than it does about the comedy that they usually throw in and I don't know. I'd love to get into it. Yeah, I don't think that's wrong. I just want to say one thing, which is just like, I reject, you know, I, I generally reject the idea of like, oh, it's it's too stylish, you know, and they forgot the heart, like that whole, that idea, you know what I mean? But um, I do too. But I, I, I like, I hate, so yeah, exactly. I hate those like easy kind of like answers for why movies like don't work. And I think this movie kind of does work on like maybe an intellectual level, but like, um, it's just not something that like, yeah, it kind of draws me in, and we can talk well, about, about that more. Well, maybe you will after we talk about it, because yeah. I have a lot of theories about this movie. <laughs> I also want to make sure that before we get into it, that, like, you know, Cullen Brothers love, as we've talked about, to talk about how they just write, they don't care what they're writing, they don't 
put that much thought into it. If we read into it, it's not, you know, it's not what they meant. I don't believe that for a minute, but you might hear some of my theories and think that they are right <laughs> because, you know, I think that there's a lot in this movie that's not on the page or at least it's not, uh, you know, spelled on the out. Yeah. Um, so let's get into it. So it was released in 1990. Uh, interestingly enough, it was released the same exact month as Goodfellas, which I think is really important because there are two gangster movies that are like basically polar opposites. I mean, um, Goodfellas also was an award sensation. It was a critical sensation. It made insane amounts of money. Miller's Crossing did not. It underperformed. It was sort of unliked when it came out. Uh, and it, you know, it's grown over the years, luckily for them, although I think they're doing fine, but it's, uh, but you know, I love this movie and I'm glad it has cause it's sort of still in the cultural conversation. Um, it stars Gabriel Byrne as Tom, Albert Finney as Leo, John Turturro as Bernie, Marcia Gay Harden as his sister Ber Verna, John Polito as Casper and J.E. Freeman as Eddie Dane. And uh, most of the story was actually taken from The Glass Key by Raymond Chandler, which I didn't know. I think it's Dashiell Hammett. I started researching it a little bit. Or Dashiell Hammett, that's what I meant. Sorry. I always get them confused. And I didn't know that um, before, but I, you know, I've never seen the movie of The Glass Key, but I'm really interested to watch that now yeah. and see what it, like how similar it is to Moon's Crossing. Um, and really it's, you know, it's, they love old detective stories. I mean, Blood Simple was such a play on that too, the film noir thing. And, yep. and this is one of those, you know, in a more direct way. But um, in a lot of ways, I think that this movie is really taking those tropes from those movies and the themes from those movies and examining them in a way that's, you know, irrever irreverent and also criticizes it a little bit, mm. I think, to my mind, which is why I think it's interesting that it was up against Goodfellas. Um, like the opening scene is a complete play on The Godfather. Like it's John Polito is looking directly at the camera mm -hmm. and he's, you know, pleading with The Godfather, basically, who is Leo, who's in charge of the city, the unnamed city that Miller's Crossing's in. And he's arguing for the... To murder Bernie, right? Yes. And you see The Godfather, right? When you watched it, did you guys spot that sort of immediate, um, you know... Homage. Yes. Homage, yes. if you will. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. yes. Yeah, the only way it would have been even more direct is if that slow pull back from John Polito's face, you know, is like, I believe and in killing Bernie. You know, yeah, or yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right, right. <laughs> he even has a similar sort of face as Enzo. Or I think his name is Enzo in the movie. And mm -hmm. he's got like a little mustache, kind of Italian man. Anyway. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So it's getting into um, sort of already spinning what we sort of immediately imagine gangster movies to be into a Coen world. I, I also think. think it's interesting. This is like the only Coen Brothers movie I can think of that uh, doesn't take place in a specific location. Uh, almost yeah. like it was born out of those books and movies, like it to like almost like an abstracted form. You know what I mean? Like it just takes place in the world of crime movies. Like could be Chicago, could be New York, could be New right. Jersey. And I saw that it was filmed in New Orleans, I think, yes. but it's so clearly not supposed to be New Orleans. Right, there's no like jazz. The there's Irish right, and the right. Italians are right. like, you know, it's right. like... But those buildings are so was... perfect. You don't want to have to set it in a studio lot where everything looks kind of like yeah. too new, kind of too clean. Yeah. You know, it's an actual building. They're like still standing from the, what, 30s or whatever era it is, you know? Like yeah, it looks yeah. beautiful. It looks beautiful. It's, I think it's supposed to be like late 20s. 29 cause... is what I read, but it's uh, it's got to be, it's prohibition. So I think yeah. that, that's the, yeah, uh, that's the, uh, the, you know, how they can kind of justify like firebombing, you know, pubs, like, right. stuff like ah, that. Ah, right. Gotcha. So we're setting up the characters a little bit in this first scene. And um, the movie follows Tom, who is the right-hand man of Leo, basically. and Another Godfather first, reference. Yeah. <laughs> and the, uh, it basically, it takes uh, an immediate turn because 
John Polito's character, Johnny Casper, is trying to get um, a guy Bernie killed. This is the first two minutes, obviously, and Tom says we should do it to keep peace and keep your power. And um, we get uh, Leo disagreeing and just saying, I'm not going to do it. And I think that that's an interesting part because... Travis, you've talked about how all of their movies start with like a single bad decision that then spirals out of control. Mm -hmm. And it happens right in this first scene. I think that's the bad decision is that Leo will not kill Bernie for no reason except for that he's, you know, involved with his sister. Yeah, Yeah. see, uh, maybe this is part of why I have a problem with this movie because like the bad decision of not to kill just some like you know, wormy guy on the outskirts of, like, the crime world does not, like, have the kind of, like, it doesn't, like, that decision is, like, not, like, kill the guy, you know, I can't get into that headspace to be, like, oh, yeah, I totally, like, understand that. Um, The whole movie is just, is, takes place in kind of, like, a moral framework that is, like, I can't, I can never enter into, and I'm not saying, like, I can't ever get on the same wavelength of a killer in a movie, that's not what I'm saying, I'm just saying But, you know, it's interesting because they do, you know, one of the things that I think is, the most interesting thing about this movie is that every major scene in it is echoed in a second scene later on in the movie where they make the opposite, you know, choice or it has the opposite outcome. Yeah. You know, I think doubles, I I think doubles are really important in this movie. I think characters have doubles and I think uh, scenes have doubles and yeah. Well, and so there's this love triangle that's sort of at the center of it, although it's not exactly a love triangle. It's more of a triangle of convenience or something, but um, you know, with, uh, Verna, Bernie's sister, and um, Leo, who's all, and then Tom is also, you know, fucking Verna. <laughs> like, and, you know, he seems to be doing it from some place of like, maybe it's because it's kind of unclear. I think it's sort of like a manifestation of his own sort of inner shittiness that he feels. And then I think it's also part of his need to prove to Leo that she's a piece of shit. Mm. And then also I think he's, you know, it's clear throughout the movie that he wants to be Leo. Like, not necessarily, like, he's just, Leo's his guy. And he's sort of, if he can fuck Leo's girlfriend, that might be part of it, too. Hmm. And Verna obviously just wants to fuck, I mean, wants to protect, and also maybe fuck, her brother Bernie. Which is is another interesting thing that comes up in the movie. But that was a forward against lip, because really she's just in it to protect Bernie. Um, And... But that whole triangle is echoed later on in the movie because another triangle comes up, you know, with Bernie, who in my mind is like the real crux of the movie. You were talking about you don't really know what to follow in this movie and who, how you sort of, you know, lay into this movie. Like Bernie's the crux of this movie. And this is my major theory for this movie that I'll throw out right now, which is that I think this is above all like the Cohen brothers meditation on why we care about machismo and why we care about, you know, celebrating masculinity and hiding anything that's not masculine, like for men, Mm. because you think about these two, like undeniably sort of nerdy, smart dudes making a very violent gangster movie and this is the first movie that sort of has a explicitly Jewish character, an explicitly gay character, mm-hmm. and like the, the one and the same. And, you know, he's the crux of this movie because it's following all these people that don't sort of know where to put their, or they know where to put their aggression, but they don't know where to put their non-aggression. Mm-hmm. They, know, they don't know where to put their feminine side, you know? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. They, they're all hiding it. Even Bernie hides it. Like, he feels so ashamed later on because he has a bit of sort of a feminine side. Yeah. And I think this is their, like, takedown of gangster movies in general and just violent movies in general. The Coen brothers take down of them. Like, yeah. Um, hard to, yeah, ahead, I mean, Josh. hard to say that they're criticizing violence in movies too much when, like, all their movies have, like, over-the-top, like, explicit... Graphic violence. Yeah, and I also I think it's think funny that I shouldn't I also think it's funny that like so much violence is shown like to an explicit degree and then like one of but you know, like 
in contradiction to like old classic gangster movies where a lot of that stuff was kind of like you know not shown well or, i don't think or that the blood was isn't all like, shown. i think no i think that I is think, yeah i think that's like on purpose you know to kind of yeah. like bring that out to the fore um but they every time there's going to be a love scene between uh verna and tom it does the old-fashioned fade to black every time right. uh no like you know i don't i think they have like one kiss in the movie before she like, i was punches trying to him. think because i was thinking going into this if this movie had a sex scene no and then i was thinking is there a single coen brothers sex scene I can't imagine there is. I mean, there's there's some bedroom scenes that have like kind of like a there is this. I mean, there's a love making scene in the in Blood Simple where which is a wonderful one because like they're having sex in this hotel room and it's kind of seedy and there's a light like, right. light of a car that the goes by the and then it cuts that's to the right. horrible hotel artwork on the wall which like uh, I don't know I think that's like a beautiful little what detail. Do you, really quick, what do you guys you guys don't have to answer? What do you think about sex scenes in movies? <laughs> Uh, they're horrible. <laughs> no, they're. I mean, anything like that can hold emotion to me is like valid in a movie. Like, uh, I think that that's fair. Sex, I scenes, sex scenes are. There's. I can think of like ten sex scenes that I absolutely love in movies. Like, right, just without even hesitation. So I think there's good. movies that like, you know, warrant it. Like, if they're pulpy and if they're, you know whatever, like if they are uh, exploitive in other ways, or even if that's the explo- exploitation that they're doing, like that's totally, it works there. But I hate, I mean, I truly have grown to just hate in a random drama when it's just like suddenly we're watching two actors burn. It takes me out of it every time. Well, I think a lot of these movies too are just, uh, most of the films aren't about you know eliciting an emotional reaction. It's just moving from plot point to plot point to plot point. So actually watching two people get it on is like not only taking away from the runtime, but like, Ugh! plus, I, you know what? Yeah. I'm pretty <laughs> sure most directors don't know how to shoot a sex scene like properly you know what i mean like you're not that's trained to do that really true. like you know there's got to be a lot of uh stylistic decisions you're gonna have to make when you're coming you know coming down right. to it so i don't know they're not done i forgot well about the blood simple one though that yeah blood simple is fantastic my favorite sex scene in any movie probably is uh mulholland drive um yeah when uh they're about to have sex and it's like th- there's so much tension because that movie's kind of been building towards it in this like very kind of uh tongue-in-cheek way and then when they're about to do it, these two like very innocent souls, and she's like, "Have you ever done this before?" To the amnesiac uh, Rita, and she goes, "I don't know." <laughs> and, <it's like laughs> one of the, and it like breaks all the tension, and then like just lets you enjoy the sex scene without like that tension hanging over you. It's beautifully right. done um, by one of our sexiest directors, David Lynch. <laughs> he definitely is. Um... Back to the plot, really quick. Uh, not really quick. <laughs> we should do an auteur detour after dark. David Lynch do. has to be on this list. <laughs> only sex, only yeah, sex. Yeah, David has Lynch will be. be soon. It's gotta happen. Anyway, although we should Travis... talk about we should talk about David Lynch in relation to the Coen Brothers because, like, I think uh, there's a big connection there. I think um, I made a little. Well, list. he definitely falls into that you know class that I sort of alluded to before, yes. where it's like I was thinking about it more this week of who the class of directors were that came out of the that time period. Um, yeah, and you know even out of the, like Easy Riders, Raging Bulls period, and it's sort of like I was putting even if they don't work together or even seem as a theme, like guys like you know, Robert Zemeckis and James Cameron, all these guys that like, I don't put them with the Coen brothers, but they're making movies. That's a different school, but I think there is a specific school of people dealing with really, really, really specific themes and really specific. um, And they even use like genre in a similar way. And like, I made, I actually started like a Venn diagram of like, like uh, absurdist language mixed. And like, and I came up with um, the main kind of figures are like David Lynch, David Cronenberg, uh, and Jim Jarmusch. Hmm. Oh, yeah. And, and then there's another... Um, and Martin Scorsese, I think, is very close to them, like, from, like, beforehand. Um, and I think then after them, I think it goes into, like, uh, Quentin Tarantino and, and uh, Wes Anderson. Anderson and stuff like that. And they're, like, a yeah. school that's, like, right there, too. Um, yeah, and, and Coen Brothers definitely, like, you know, we've talked about it. They transcend... To the two, to the two eras, like yes. they sort of live in the P.T. Anderson world and in the, you know, David Lynch world, which yeah. I don't put them together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, so you know, I was saying that um, 
uh, what's his name? Oh, this is the first collaboration is worth mentioning with uh, John Turturro, who yeah. becomes one of their featured players. What a awesome too! What a performance! He's incredible, and he's also not Jewish, which is interesting. That you know he plays a Jewish guy in this, and then you know such a Jewish guy in Barton Fink next, and. Uh, it's weird that they cast him in a weird way, I think. Like, I don't know what... I think he's just too good to not cast. Right. They, uh, they, you know, made him uh, Jewish in this movie. They made him uh, Hispanic in uh, right. Fargo. I'm, I'm sorry, Big Lebowski. Big and Lebowski, then they, yeah. they challenged uh, Spike Lee to cast him as black in one of his movies. <laughs> right. Yeah. I, that, I didn't know I was their challenge. <laughs> anyway. Um... He's an incredible actor. I mean, watching him again in this, this week, it was like, he's just that, we'll get to that scene as we go through the movie a little bit, but like that fucking performance. And then his later performance later in the movie too. Anyway, uh, the reason why I think of him as being the crux of the movie is because, like I said, he embodies to me sort of everything that gangsters hated, or at least the gangsters in this movie hated. Yeah. You know, he's not shy about his uh, queerness. He really doesn't, um, you know, this opening scene that we still haven't moved off of, John Polito just keeps referring to him as the shmada, which is like a Yiddish word that means like dirty old rag or like something like that, you know? Worthless. And it's like, they just, yeah, worthless. And so, you know, they, they immediately, it's very coded the way that he's talking about him in that scene. You know, he keeps saying like, you know, yeah, lots of people know about, you know, um, my fixing fights and that kind of thing, but it's a matter of ethics. Like, who do we trust? We can't trust the schmata. Like, it's really coded in there about that it's because of his Jewishness and because, you know, we quickly learn also that he's gay. Um... The other major f- player in that scene is Eddie the Dane, who uh, is the right-hand man, sort of a mirror of Tom, because they love fucking mirroring, mm-hmm. who is also secretly gay and is, you know, has his own agenda, like sort of, what's up, Travis? I see your eyes. Well, is it, se- <laughs> is it a secret that he's gay? Or the way I read it was that, I mean... You know, history is not a straight line, you know, and like when you look, I think they were making a conscious effort to say, like, if you go back to this era and like these super tough guys could have like, he's my boy, you know, like talking about mink and stuff like that. And that was like accepted, like in a way that nowadays, like it might be like weirder, you know, like I think I agree with you when I say secretly, when I say secretly gay, I guess I just mean it's more that he's like, ashamedly gay or something like that. I don't know. I don't think it's, like, he's not using that as his first foot forward, you know? Like, he's, you know, it's, like, a thing that everybody knows about them and is kind of okay with, but they definitely are derogatory about it, mm-hmm. you know? they like, Right. Um, and so I think that that's, you know, that's another, the next mirroring of that triangle that I talked about before between Verna and uh, Tom and Leo is through Bernie and um, Eddie the Dane and then we later briefly meet Mink who's the first Buscemi fucking appearance in a Coen Brothers movie. Looking which... 100% like Bill Skarsgård, right? Totally! I was thinking the same <laughs> thing. I'm like, is this Pennywise? What? Yes. And it's funny <laughs> it's funny it's that he's like uh, he's such a big part of the movie his character, but you only see him that one time if I'm not mistaken, right? Yeah, yeah, he doesn't show up. His again. character his is fundamental to this film. Me. Yeah, but we only see yeah. right exactly. But, but yeah, he's Bernie unidentifiable. Takes, I mean, Bernie design. is like I said, he's the crux of the movie. Everybody is sort of talking about him and through and you know he doesn't show up for probably I didn't you know I wasn't looking at the time, but it's probably twenty minutes before he shows up at all. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's um, a ha- I think it's like a half hour. Um, yeah, I bet. But uh, Ian, I'm just gonna say I love your theory, and I have some theories about Bernie's appearance in this movie too, and what it means. I think mine kind of dovetails with yours a bit. Okay, let's hear. Uh, well, I mean, I I think you're kind of right on. I mean, I just remember the line that uh, Verna says where she's like. Why do you hate him, you know, about uh, Bernie right. to, to Tom? I feel like if, if, if Bernie represents, like, the feminine side and, like, the queer side, this kind of suppressed side of all these, like, men, you know, in this world, 
uh, I think he specifically is that for Tom. Because, um, like I said, this movie has, like, doubles of everything. Like, there's, like, mm-hmm. always, like, they reverse things. And they, they'll show you one scene, again, where, like, the, uh, the cops are raiding, like, all the Italian uh, establishments. And then, like, right. later in the movie, they're doing the exact same thing to the Irish establishments. There's the trio of, like, main kind of figures on the Italian mob side. There's the same, like, almost same trio of people on the Irish mob side. Um, but, yeah, kind of central to all of it is Bernie and the role he plays. Bernie is almost never seen with any other character besides Tom. Bernie Mm -hmm. is just, when Tom comes home and sits in his chair, Bernie is like a mirror image across from him in his chair. Um, And I feel like he's like a kind of like doppelganger to Tom. Like he says, like you're... it's my na- it's my nature. This is what I do. I scurry around the edges. He not only is he like you know again Jewish and queer and all these things that like maybe Tom who's like ethnic in his own way like you know wants to like suppress or something, but he also um, he's very open about what he does and why. Like you know I yeah. I'm you know I play the angles because I'm like a rat yeah. and I'm a criminal and I do things to survive I don't whereas to die. he basically <laughs> has like no no code no morals um, mm-hmm. whereas like everybody else in the movie has created for themselves a moral framework that they feel comfortable in but they don't necessarily you know what I mean? it doesn't actually you know hold up under scrutiny right like they're all bad people you know but right. but but he's the one who's like openly like yeah I don't care I just do what I want I don't kill anybody whatever um, and he's also not wrong. Like he's no, I mean, he's really absolutely. even though they're all shitty, you know. But he's the only one who's just like, yeah, I fucking do this shit, but I don't deserve to die for it. Like I don't, I don't kill anybody. Yeah. <laughs> like you mm-hmm. know, he's he's very sympathetic in that way. Like even though he is a piece of shit, and he is like very abrasive too. Like I can imagine not liking Bernie. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. I think that that's important too. I can imagine him being. If he was in my life, I'd be like this fucking guy. Yeah, <laughs> I wouldn't call him a schmata. <laughs> but, but, but like, I mean, but, again, <laughs> but like, okay, so this is the movie I felt could have uh, benefited from voiceover narration. You know, the Coen Brothers mm. aren't afraid to do a voiceover narration, and I always like love it when they do. This movie, on the surface, kind of has a, a main character that's more identifiable, like that, than most of their movies. Like, it's like a handsome leading man that you kind of like follow through the story, and he seems. Like, you want to identify with him, but you can't ever. You don't even... Well, that's why I had a hard time with it when I was younger. But now, I don't think that you're supposed to identify with him. No, I don't think think so either. But, like, like, but I think uh, what I was going to say was that I feel like Bernie almost acts like his voiceover sometimes. Like, he's, mm -hmm. like, he... Like, when they were... In those scenes where they're talking in the bedroom, it's almost like he's voicing some sort of, like, fear of Tom's and stuff. And when he's... There's all these shots of Tom in the car when when Bernie's being like dragged away to his death where he's like screaming out in pain and Tom is just sitting there with that blank face that he always has. And it's like he's like the only one who like shows a lot of emotion in the movie. Yeah. Besides Polito. That's true. <laughs> John Polito is great. Also. Also. He's, yeah. I mean, he's really a standout to me. Um. Albert Finney, we can go through the major cast right now, really just, you know, briefly, I think is, I mean, oh, this is one thing I'll say about him. I was tripping watching it and he realizing that he's five years younger than Tom Cruise when he made this movie. Oh, Tom Cruise today? <laughs> yeah, wow. Tom Cruise today. Wow. He's five years younger <laughs> than Tom Cruise today because the guy's got a look and it is not like a younger than Tom Cruise. <laughs> like, like, I don't know. I think he's great. You know, the part was written for, I can't remember what his name Trey, is. Uh, Trey, uh, Trey Wilson. Yeah. Is that it? Something like that. Nathan Senior. Nathan Arizona, Nathan Arizona. Yeah. And he died, you know, before the movie started shooting. It'd be interesting. I don't know. Here's what I was thinking more. I don't even know how I would picture him in that role, but I was wondering since it's, we've been watching these chronologically, like what would have happened if M. Emmett Walsh would have been playing Leo? Like I, I, I slotted him into that role in my mind, like as I'm sort of thinking about recasting the movie. Interesting. And I think that that would make it a different movie, but also maybe better. And I have no problem with Albert Finney in this movie. I think he's great and, you know, 
I would yeah. love to see M. Emmett Walsh jump out of the window like he did when he was on fire <laughs> and hang down from the rafters like, like Albert you know Finney. Like, M. M. Obviously, it's not really <laughs> him, but like. Albert Finney does not look like he could do that. Tom Cruise looks like he could do that, but Albert Finney does not. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, I think, seeing, yeah, anyway. I think he kind of pulls that scene off, though, just in, in like the in the way that he's just kind of inflappable, you know, and you mm-hmm. do get the feeling early on that he's going to like, oh, he's past his prime. He's kind of like isolated in this like little office and stuff. But when it, you know, in his like vel- purple velvet slippers, but then when push comes yeah. to shove, he can still like. Well, let me catch anybody who might be listening to this up to that scene really quick, because uh, Leo's um, basically his empire starts to crumble once he makes this decision the Italians start to um, basically rise in power. The power in this city basically comes from, you know, who controls the politicians because it's a time of prohibition and they're, you know, if you own the police and the politicians, then you run the city. And Leo does for the majority of the movie until the Italians, you know, get that get through his armor because of Verna, because he has this allegiance to Verna. And they start to grow. And then Leo, basically they set a hit on Leo, which he survives. That's the scene that we're talking about. It's this incredible set piece. Like it stands aside from the movie. It's almost, you know, I was listening to Mike Miller, the uh, editor of this movie. He's one of, he's the only person who ever edited a movie besides the Coen brothers of their filmography. And he did this one in Raising Arizona. I think maybe they had another one for... They had another one, I think, for the first cut of uh, Blood Simple, I think. Oh, well, I don't know. I mean, I I know that Roderick Janes is the editor for all of their movies, and that's their pen name for their editor. Which I heard from Mike Miller in this interview I listened to with him that you know the whole point of using that pseudonym was because they wanted to look like they had a a team yeah, you know yeah, yeah. they didn't want in the credits for it to look like they did everything because that looked less professional to them mm-hmm. and then it's just sort of stuck like so he but then he came on Mike Miller did for the first for the next two movies after Blood Simple and mm-hmm. then um you know he's talking about this scene where Leo gets ambushed and how it's been, you know, sort of hailed as one of the great scenes of the 90s. It's in 1990, but it's sort of, it's an iconic piece. It's and it's good. fucking good. I think it's great. And I think it's so different from the movie with its extreme violence. It's got this like cartoonish, you know, moment where he's like, Leo's just escaping the people not when he jumps out of the thing that's kind of cartoonish too he jumps from the window but then he gets his tommy gun and he just empties it into this guy that's up in the window and the guy's dancing a jitterbug and you know the circle spinning his own yeah the circle, <laughs> spinning comes a circle. Back. the circle's all over this movie too it's got the hat which we can get into the hats in this movie but it follows a hat the whole movie um which is a circle. But yeah, it's anyway, a good scene, so but yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't, I'm not even like making a case for the scene, <laughs> but I think like as, I think it is a great scene, but I also think like more importantly is that it was important for them to like, if my take on it is correct and it's their takedown of machismo or whatever, like they needed to also show like the most ridiculous, brutal violence. Like it wouldn't work without this scene. I don't think if that's the take. And there also is again, a mirror scene with uh, John Polito where he kills the Dane, which is the other act of extreme violence in the movie where the guy, where he gets smashed in the face with the, uh, the shovel from the fireplace and then shot in the head, like on camera, uh, which is also like a very disturbing scene and done uh, kind of in a different tone. With like the you know the like the Evil Dead camera comes back and stuff like that, I think an even more um, direct mirror scene to that scene, though, is when Bernie ambushes Tom for the second time up in the apartment, mm-hmm. and then basically you know puts Tom on the spot. So Tom at this point in the movie has switched sides from the Italian or from the Irish to the Italians, as far as we know. Because 
uh, Leo basically boots him out. Leo's kind of, you know, lost his, lost his power. And so, uh, he finds out about Verna and Tom, you know, kicks his ass. Now Leo's on his own. He gets ambushed, although he survives. Then Tom goes home. He sees Bernie sitting there and he does the same thing. So Bernie says to him, now we're in this together because, you know, we'll go back in a second to get to why they're in this together, but we're in this together. And I, um, you know, basically if you tell anybody that I'm still alive, you're fucked and I've got all the power now. And then Tom attempts to jump out of the window to stop him. Right. (laughs) He doesn't have slippers on. It's like focused on his, it focuses in on his bare feet Mm -hmm. and then he falls on his fucking face. Mm -hmm. Bernie laughs at him and is basically just like, who the fuck do you think? What would you you do if you caught me? Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, that scene is so important as a mirror to the Leo scene, because to me, it's like Tom's whole story arc is him trying to be Leo or really trying to like embrace the Leo in him that he sees, you know, and he tries and he fucking fails. He can't like quite literally, he can't fit into his shoes because he's barefoot. Whereas Leo like explicitly has slippers on. Like they make that a point. Yeah. I don't know. I thought that was an interesting mirror. No, that's scene a great that point. Yeah, totally. Um, just into the plot again. The reason why Tom and Bernie are tied together at this point is because of this incredibly, probably the most powerful scene in the movie. I mean, definitely to me. I don't know how you guys felt about it, but where Tom joins up with the Italians in order to prove himself, essentially, Casper has... Uh, or Casper and Eddie Dane have them has Tom go out to Miller's Crossing, which is the woods where they do their killing and kill Bernie. And John Turturro (laughs) is pleading for his life in the most like almost, you know, aggressively long segment Mm -hmm. where he's just crying and holding onto the tires of the car mm-hmm. and just really like mm-hmm. you know violently you know trying to trying hang on to not life to die. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah and it's powerful and tom can't do it like he he lets him go and that's like a moment where it's an interesting moment because you know tom i think they allude to the fact that he's not a killer they i mean i know bernie says that he's like you're not a killer this isn't us you're not like you one know? of these animals yeah yeah you're not like one of these animals um <laughs> But he's also, you know, he's pretty ruthless anyway. So it's kind of strange. And he did want uh, Bernie to die. Like, that was his whole thing for the arc for the previous part of the movie is trying to convince Leo to kill Bernie. So, what? I mean, what was your guys' take on why he didn't do it? Was it just because he felt sympathy for him? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. We don't. We don't. We have never seen him kill anybody on screen. You know, uh, I we think don't. He hasn't. I think he hasn't. You think he has not killed anyone before? I think he has not killed anybody. I before. think that's right. part of it, right? Because he feels like this hard-boiled, you know, stone-faced guy. But at the same time, it's they also probably want to bring to the fact that just killing someone isn't that simple, and it shouldn't be that easy of a task for someone just to just smoke somebody and like, you know, to end someone's life. And uh, even though he's playing the tough guy and all, I think that and just the fact that Turturro is just amazing, like just the fa- how long was the, you know, uh, uh, you know, your heart, you know, look, look, in, your look in your heart, yeah. right? Look like it's heart. it's so long, but so but good. he's but it's amazing how he maintains the intensity yet isn't overdoing it at the same time. Like I can still well, be that, with this uh, this lengthy. I think most maybe directors might have cut that shorter. You know, like all right, okay. Well, in that Mike Miller uh, interview that I listened to, the editor's interview, he talks about how the continuity is all fucked up in that segment. There's no, you know, but when you have a performance like that, like you don't care about that. You just let it go because it's so just undeniable. uh, It seemed like they were taking uh, the end of like the, the previous take 
and like yeah. over, and doing it, showing it again from a different angle, saying the same right. line in a different way because both ways were so good. Like I think that's what he said. That uh, they did. That's they had, it. You like, could tell three... he perfect takes yeah. and they're like well we they just kept have as to much use of it them. as possible yeah and it makes, <laughs> it makes sense in the moment <laughs> that you'd be like we just have to use these takes because yeah. we can't not have this like it would be unfair to the audience <laughs> to not show them totally yeah, and exactly. i think to answer <laughs> to touch back on what you also asked ian about why wouldn't he kill him uh it's one thing to say oh you know you know we should have some guy knock off bernie uh and whose sister i'm sleeping with and another thing to have to look at that sister in the eye as the actual killer of her brother, you know, to actually physically do it himself. Um, I think he's probably seeing all of those things in Bernie before he, you know, as he's pointing the gun at him there. So there may be something to that too. Totally. I think my thoughts on that scene are like, uh, you know, I feel like a big part of this movie is uh, Tom feeling like he's kind of above it all too. Like, and he doesn't want to be like fully, you know, that you're saying like he, the whole movie is about him wanting to be like uh, Leo, but it's also him wanting to be like his own man and not, you know, not cross anybody, you know what I mean? And do right by everybody and like kind of and do right by himself. And like, I don't know. I feel like, I think that's the I feel more like, optimistic view. Right. Movie, because to me, I think, but I mean, like, I, I'm saying like, I'm acknowledging that there's like a conflict there though. You know yeah. what I mean? Like between, like yeah. he does want to be Leo in some way, you know what I mean? But it's like, that's where the conflict is. And the fact I that think, he, I think like as he gets into, you know, the choices that he's making. And we, we learn later uh, that he is, you know, incredibly smart. He sort of masterminded the whole plot of the movie, mm-hmm. you know, and he knew what was going to happen all along and all that stuff. And uh, I think as we, you know, see him sort of, well, you know, without skipping straight to the end of the movie, but if we get into like him becoming his own man, if that's the arc of the movie for him, um, I think that that is optimistic. I think that more to me, this might be too subtle. This is one of the things I was saying might be kind of out there and definitely not on the screen. But to me, I think that like Tom is absolutely in love with Leo. I think that like yes. Leo's in love with Tom, Tom's in love with Leo and they can't have each other. If there is a love triangle between Tom and Verna and Leo, it's between Tom and Leo. Like they don't like, like even when T- Leo and Verna are engaged at the end of the movie, the love loss between Tom and Leo at that moment is so much more stronger than what you know is between Tom and well, yeah, Leo. He, and he just Verna. goes, yeah, he just watches Vera go, Verna go and is like, oh, she's taking the car. And when he, but when Leo yeah. goes, he's like, oh, oh, oh. like, yeah, yeah I mean, that's, they make that and very clear. I think clear. like, if you think of it that way, um, as him sort of pining after this person that he can't have. And the only reason why he can't have him is because, you know, we talked about dream sequences before with the Coen brothers, and I think it's important that there is one dream sequence in this movie. There's a disgust dream sequence that we see only as the opening, you know, scrawl of Miller's Crossing is on screen, which is his hat blowing away. And he talks about it with Verna. He says, I had this dream where I... um my hat blew away and I, you know, and she says, oh, did you run after it? Did you try to chase it? And he says, no, there's nothing more foolish than a man trying to chase his own hat. And if you think about it in the way that like he's unwilling to look foolish in order to chase what he wants, the whole movie he's chasing after his hat. It happens over and over again where he loses his hat. Somebody takes his hat. He's constantly chasing after his hat, but he does not want anybody to think of him as the kind of guy that would chase after his own hat. Yes. It's a great call. It's also funny that he um, is Irish, the actor and the character, and they, uh, the way that he says hat and the way that he says heart are almost indistinguishable. Mm. I think that that's not even an accident. Yeah. I think that they like le- leaned into that because I really think that him not chasing Leo at the end was sadly it's i think it's a sad ending i think yeah. it's because he doesn't he can't embrace that part of himself that really is like where i took my idea of like the cohen's examining why men don't feel like they can like be what they want to be you know why they feel like they have to put on this sort of masculine front yeah i think because that, yeah yeah, because he doesn't chase after the hat, and he doesn't chase after Leo, and he puts on his hat at the end. And if you think and of just what, yeah, yeah and it, I was just gonna say, if you think of uh, Bernie again as like this kind of 
doppelganger of Tom, like, or is this part of Tom, right? Like the queer, like, uh, right. feminized part. And then he exactly literally right. kills it at the he end. He literally yeah. kills him. And his line as he kills him is what heart is <laughs> Bernie for the first time says, yeah, I mean, not for the first time for the thousandth time, but in like a more less, you know, convincing real pleading <laughs> way. And more of just like, a, I know this isn't going to work, but like, can you do it? He says, look into your heart. And Tom fucking kills him and says to himself, not to Bernie, he says, what heart? Like he's, done, he's, he's killed it. You know, he's not going to chase after Leo. It's absolutely a deconstruction. I think it's really important that it came out the same, you know, they had no idea that Goodfellas was, I mean, I'm sure they probably knew that Goodfellas was happening, but they didn't know as they were writing it, I'm sure that Goodfellas was going to come out the same month as this movie. But if you look at the two movies, I love Goodfellas. We could actually like talk for a minute about your guys' opinion on Goodfellas, if you want. I mean, one of my favorite movies, top 10. Yeah. Whereas this, you know, Miller's Crossing is not top 100, probably. That's fair. And I, <laughs> I would put, I mean, Goodfellas like miles above this movie. I say it is one of my favorite Coen Brothers movies. It's my favorite Coen Brothers movie is probably not as good as Goodfellas to me, you know, so yeah, I'm not okay. even saying, you know what okay. I mean? But, um, but I do think that like, if they're Chris really quick, I don't want to pass you up. What do you think about Goodfellas? It's one of my favorite Scorsese movies ever. And he's made some of my favorite yeah. movies. Uh, it's one of those movies that I would just put on and watch at any time. It doesn't need like a mood for me, which is kind of rare. Most films, I need to have a particular mood going into it. I could probably watch Goodfellas almost at any given time. It's that rounded and that, uh, uh entertaining for me. So I love it. It's one of my favorites easily. Yeah. So the reason why, I, I mean, I agree. I think it's fucking brilliant. I love it. I think that if there's one criticism that I, not criticism, but one take on it that is valid and is um, worthy of being a criticism, even if I don't think it is necessarily, it's that Martin Scorsese likes these guys. Like he wants to be, I mean, you know, he, he's, he acts like, I mean, there's a lot of people that say he doesn't and that like he shows, you know, crime equals bad, but like, it's not like that. Like, I feel like more than, I think Miller's Crossing, he doesn't like these guys. Coen brothers don't, you know, the Coen I don't brothers like don't. Them. I think they, yeah, I don't think they like the characters. Like, I don't like the characters. Like, they're not yeah. pleasant to even like watch, which is why, again, with this like dense plot and this dense dialogue, you know, as impressive as it is, as like, as you know, kind of see, like beautiful as it is, it gets a little tiresome by the, by the almost two hour mark of of Miller's Crossing. But I didn't feel tired by it this time. I think it's it's a movie that really rewards um, patience and also like um, rewatches, like all of the Coen Brothers movies. That is true. You yes, know? I think like the more the more I've seen it over the years. And especially leading up to this last watch, I really think that like, like I said, I'm not criticizing Goodfellas. I fucking love Goodfellas. But I think that like, if you look at these two movies that came out in October of 1990, these two gangster movies that came out, one of them is like, violence is bad. And one of them is like, violence is good. <laughs> it's like, I wouldn't, I, know, I wouldn't I put it like that, mm. but uh, I see what you're saying. I don't, I think I would. I think that is like, I, I felt like that about Wolf of Wall Street. I know lots of people don't, but I Well, I don't think, not... I, I don't think it's that it falls on one side or the other. I love Wolf of Wall Street, but I mean, one thing it does very well is show, like, I always think of that scene where all the people that Leo kind of like plucked from, and they tell these stories about how their lives sucked and stuff like that before he kind of put them on the team. You know, he's like, he saw something in me. He trusted me, he put me on this team and now I'm with him a thousand percent. Like it's about that you, when being on in that community, that like tight knit community and like no one else outside that group like matters. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, I think it's not so much as like, this is good for society or, you know what I mean? Even the individuals, but it's like, this is a phenomenon that exists, like, you know, that people form these kind of tribes that do horrible things and stuff like that. And this yeah. is this is the attraction to it. And this is why, um, you know, people are drawn. You know, this is why people like, I don't know, are drawn right. to these kind of movies. Do you think and stuff like that. really do you think you would have liked 
this movie more if it didn't star Gabriel Byrne and Marsha Gay Harden? No, I actually love Gabriel Byrne. I think he he has like you know I always think of the music in this movie, uh, the score, which yeah, is like you never get into flawlessly Carter Burwell, but like he's beautiful, so fucking good. But I don't feel like the um. I don't feel like the music resonates with any part of the film to me, except for Gabriel Byrne's performance. Like when I first saw the movie, I felt like, um, like, that, like I was missing something. And if there was something that kind of clicked with me someday, that like I would understand, like Ga- you know, Gabriel Byrne's like the emotional core of the movie, and it, um, that you know that this music was kind of like alluding. I think to. you hit it though. I think the emotional core is like him battling. Bernie, who was another part of him, right? Like, I and I, and those that's... scenes, those scenes are really good. You know what I mean? But I think they're kind of buried under this kind of like, um, really, I don't know, convoluted kind of like exercise in kind of like um, performing a um, a redo of like a gangster noir kind of movie. And I think it's interesting to compare it to Goodfellas because Goodfellas is so much more. Um, less true to those old genres but borrows so much in terms of like the visual language from like everything from like you know gangster movies to like musicals you know what i mean um and that movie has like kind of like an emotional swell to it that like you know grabs you like from the inside that's the kind of movie that really speaks to me and i think like the score of fargo to me that is a score that kind of brings out the pathos and like the tragedy of the story of Fargo. Whereas if, if the score was different, maybe you wouldn't, I wouldn't have as like a, as strong an emotional right. reaction to that. But I think Fargo is a movie that like I, um, that is feels so much pow- more powerful to me than, than this. And again, I, 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 Ian, I think you're right on in your reading of the movie. Um, and I think it is a movie that like Chris is, if you watch it more, you know, you'll just get more and more out of it. I, I'm at a place now where I feel like I'm very, I like it a lot again, but like I, I don't think I'm ever gonna like be like I'm never gonna fall in love with this movie. You it's know? funny, yeah. Know. It's funny you say that because I think about because again I've only seen it once and then I went and revisited certain little scenes just to see like the Albert Finn. Like, is that is that a guy? Is that a person in drag? <laughs> right. And right. I went back to right. see it after I'd seen the movie because I didn't want to like distract myself. But um, I suspect that, and this is true with a couple other Cohen films that. Once I've got the plot down, I'm a little maybe less interested in revisiting it. So I not to say I don't want to see this movie again, but I would want to wait a little while so that uh, not all the details are fresh in my mind before I were to see it again. Because of yeah. uh, I, there's certain vibrant, like amazing characters that the Coens have created over the years and not one of them is in this film for me. Uh, <laughs> you know, I. I it's hard to describe. I mean, you're that's Bernie Birnbaum yeah, is think, one of the most iconic characters. Like that scene is etched in cinema history to me. Like, listen to your heart. <laughs> Look into your heart. I mean, I think it's yeah, Bernie so is great. I think the, I think the Dane is great. I think he's a really funny yeah, way to like really get just to talk pull about out the Dane. just pull out like the like kind of quintessential like you know hard jawed kind of like thug yeah. like from like muscle gangster guys, but like um, actually show how really violent he is and like how sadistic and and uh and i, and I think yeah. that there's a good point there into the fact that he's like gay but like not showing that he's gay you know and he's yeah. like repressed that within himself and like maybe overcompensates maybe like pushes himself to be this like violent sicko because he can't be like i don't know um, yeah i think um do you know who was supposed to play this yes role? uh the dude from fargo the uh right. Sp- and stormar and peter stormar yeah right? of course yeah, yeah. Peter yeah. Stormar, right? yeah. yeah. Who, and that would have been really, amazing. It was be called, he would have been, been funny. He would have been Eddie the Swede, they, they said, you know, oh, but then they changed it to Eddie the Dane. Right. But, I, but I think that guy is so perfect because he is sort of like almost like an anonymous guy, like as if you've plucked him out of one of those yeah. old movies, put him in color. Um, but I love that he, even though he's like, again, does like acts of like grotesque violence on screen. Mm. But like when he gets like, when he talks back to his boss, he goes, nuts. Yeah. Like as if that would have <laughs> right. been like a strong <laughs> right. language in that that era. Like that was a beautiful like yeah. detail to me. Yeah. That's very like um, Cohen's. I think uh you know, I I asked you and I'll answer for myself, but um I think Gabriel Byrne uh is not one of my favorite actors by any stretch of the imagination. I don't think he's great in a lot of things, but I think he's you know awesome in this movie and I love him. But I do think that Marsha Gay Harden, <laughs> like not to fucking 
cancel myself by calling out the only female in this movie, but I think that she sucks. I don't like her in this movie. I don't think that, like, she... I, I feel like I'm watching somebody play dress up when she's on screen like she's you know acting out what she thinks those 40s or 20s or whatever girls were like i don't know do you think uh francis mcdormand would have been a better um well, she does pop up i don't think that she's she great would have... she's great in the movie too I mean, her she one does pop scene. up again and it's one of those things like we've talked about where when she comes up you're just like god fucking damn it i love her <laughs> like... well, it's a funny era because it's like the, she's the only one that i caught that's from like one of the earlier films so you don't have that sense of like hey it's a you know it's a coen brothers jamboree like when you're watching mm-hmm. them in uh uh yeah, in order amazing but, Arizona, yeah. definitely but you, behind but you got john turturro scenes, making but... a you know making an appearance you've got young and steve buscemi, buscemi. Yeah. And like uh looking like a uh snack and um <laughs> john Polito. And, then, and then also yeah john Polito yeah, again john Polito and yeah i'll just say again you. what an actor like anytime i see him in anything he's always perfect i love him so much in this movie just like mouth hanging open like a fish like you know like right, just right. like trying to get oxygen like so good um but i was also going to say the dude who drives um john polito to tom's apartment at the end of the movie that guy uh-huh. shows up later in oh brother where art thou as babyface nelson and he oh, right. is francis mcdormand's brother who's one of my favorite characters in the man who wasn't there he has the some like oh yeah dumb which lines. is funny because yeah. they're talking about hair too they're talking about cutting hair there's a scene yeah. where they discuss yeah, like true. haircuts and that's he true. actually is the barber of john polito if i was i'm trying to think just off the top of my head like who I mean, if you had like a Michelle Pfeiffer in this role, uh, you know, in the Marcia Gay Harden role, yeah, somebody that like I think that Frances McDormand is too um, likable. Likable, yeah. I don't <laughs> think that I don't mm. think like I think one of the things mm. that Marcia Gay Harden doesn't do is that as a younger person watching this movie, I thought that you were supposed to believe in the love story between Tom and Verna. Right. I thought that that was like a tragedy of the movie is that Tom and Verna couldn't be together. Well, they have no, they have zero chemistry in the movie. And I, right. and I, I don't, right. I, are you like, do you think that's Marsha Gay Harden's fault? Cause I feel like maybe that, I don't, I don't think supposed to not have any chemistry. Though. I don't think that's right. supposed to have chemistry, but I think that what she didn't play was like, or not, at least not enough for like 15 year old me to understand. She didn't play the part where, you get that she doesn't like any of them and she's just doing what she can to survive too. Mm. You know, I think like it's there, but like, I imagine how somebody with more cunning, like would have played it like a Michelle Pfeiffer. I think Mm. she would have been great. Yeah. So let's just go back in time. (laughs) And also she's like, also has that classic look where, you know, yeah, I, I, I mean, I think Michelle Pfeiffer would have been great. I mean, just to be clear, but like she doesn't I, look Jewish I, enough, though. You know, she's got a little. I mean, more that's true. That's true. <laughs> that's a great point. <laughs> if they're, I mean, when they adopted, I don't know. Maybe that would. Work. Maybe like uh, I'm trying to think of who else we got. I don't want to sit sit here and like spend too much time because I didn't think that much about it before. But maybe like a you know one of the broad um, city women. <laughs> I'm just thinking the great no, Jewish actresses of our time. <laughs> uh, no, like I think Marsha Gay Harden is fine. I, I I feel like the whole movie feels a little Deborah bit, Winger. I feel like the whole movie is Winger. feels <laughs> yes. feels a little bit like a costume kind of recreation of one of these old movies, and um, you know, with the purpose. But it's, it's her but, scenes that feel like that to me. I mm. think that it's when Verna and Tom are doing their crackling dialogue yeah. and they're sort of like. Yeah, see, like my <laughs> fucking Edward G. Robinson bullshit. Like that it really feels like, oh, these guys are playing dress up, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. And I don't know that that was like the Coen brothers idea. I right. think that that's sort of the way that it, because of the unfortunate Marsha Gay Harden Damn. <laughs> of it all. You hate Marsha Gay I'm Harden. taking her down. I don't like her. <laughs> really? In anything? Have you seen The Mist? Uh, maybe. Have you seen uh, what's the Mystic River? Yeah. She only is in movies with the word mist in the title, I'm realizing. (laughs) Yeah, Mistress Crossing. (laughs) She's the meh lady. (laughs) Uh, She, uh, I like her okay. I mean, yeah, she's not one of my favorites, but like, I didn't have any problem with her in this movie that I was aware of. You know, just, I had kind of like a, I definitely did not care about their romance or whatever the hell it was. Um, yeah, right. I don't think we're like supposed I said, to. I, though. I think that's the point. Right? I, I unfortunately right. think that that was the problem. Is that like 
you feel like you're supposed to care about their romance, but if she would have played it the way that he played it, where it's like, clearly we don't fucking like each other, but, you know, we're in this because I want to protect Bernie and you fucking want to, you know, yeah, I think get there's into a, Leo's pants. I think, you know, yeah, I guess the movie has been criticized from the perspective of like, it's so clever and it's so like, you know, kind of complicated for its own sake, you know what I mean? But, but you know, maybe there was a, a different way to kind of get to the point, like the message that you're talking about, Ian, without so much like tiresome kind of like, I don't know, like, uh, I don't know. But the stuff I like the most in the movie, though, is the just kind of straightforward kind of gangster stuff. You know, I think that works <laughs> the best. The, like the quasi emotional parts like don't always work for me and they feel like, I don't know. That's why the movie doesn't work for me. It's just like, I can't get into it on an emotional level. Interesting. I don't know. I'm inclined to well, we that. are hitting sort of the, uh, the hour mark, the end of the hour. So why don't we, I wanted to do this. Um, let's go through right now and say in order, I'm going to go Miller's crossing blood simp or raising Arizona blood simple. That's your ranking so far. That's my ranking so far. Chris, what do you got? Blood Simple, Miller's Crossing, Raising Arizona. Oh, interesting. Okay. Um, this is very hard for me. Uh, I mean, my number one is Raising Arizona, no question of these three. Mm-hmm. But number two, I mean, if I had to rewatch one, um, yeah, maybe Blood Simple next and then, or, but can I do a tie? I'll do a tie. Yeah, sure. They're both. They're both. Sure. Sure. They're Why both. Not? They're both. I mean, they're both rewatchable. I like them both. Before a lot. we yeah. submit this totally, to the Library of Congress, yes. then you have to make a decision. But for I, now, that's fine. Can I, I just totally say one thought more you would have. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. No, I, th- I totally thought Travis, you were going to say Miller's Crossing at the bottom, just due to the way in which you know you've been talking no, about just, it. A surprising. You know, there's a thing. You know, the I've been watching a lot of like horror sequels lately, and like mm-hmm. uh, Halloween Three was a movie that was like. Critically hated season of the hated witch at the time season of the witch. Yeah. yeah after the fact it sort of got this like cult following now Anytime anyone brings it up online Everyone chimes in about how it's the greatest Halloween movie the most underrated Halloween movie And it's this there's this phenomenon where like underrated movies get lifted up by people kind of beyond where maybe they should be And I feel like that that happens a little bit with Miller's Crossing So I guess my my Mm. reaction to it is just like um, a little bit like uh, you know you can talk about what, what's great about this movie for hours like it's there's like so many amazing lines like uh, yeah I mean, a lot didn't of even like start quoting that much I yeah mean, you know it starts with like sister when I raised hell you'll know it yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like say, I love all of those and that opening scene I mean that's like a perfect scene and I feel like I also feel like in that opening scene every character kind of reveals their weakness which is like the for the Dane it's uh, Mink uh, for John Polito, it's like his like inferiority complex and his sense of ethics that kind of boxes him in. Mm-hmm. And for, um, you know, I think for, uh, what's his name? Uh, Tom, it's, it's Tom. a little more complicated, but it's like the first thing that kind of sets him off like, Whoa, was when just yeah. like, um, when Leo doesn't, when listen, Leo to doesn't listen to him, which is like kind of yeah. maybe the first time it sounds like, right. they, like where they've had a big disagreement. And then. And again, he doesn't listen to him, but he doesn't say anything either. He just kind of gets a shrug. But they have, like, of course, an unspoken language, like a married couple uh, yeah, that he doesn't respond to. Yeah, they feel like they love each yes. other. I mean, that's that, like... But they have a closeness that's like un- yeah. like no one else in the movie does. And uh, they... Um, but then uh, he also has the weakness later, it's revealed, of the um, gambling and drinking, which you could... I kind of, I feel at the end of that first scene. I yeah, mean, and I kind of think of that as like a, um, just these kind of like he talks about like why do people do the things they do? Like what is this thing inside of me that I can't kind of control? And it's like these compulsions to gamble and that you know he's so logical and he's so you know um, do, concerned with like doing the safe thing or the right thing, the smart thing. There's nothing smart about like getting drunk and like losing your belongings like in a bar in the middle of the night with like hoodlums but and there's nothing you know smart about like gambling your money away and owing a ton of money either but like he's like kind of driven to do these things um you know there's a the the wind that blows the hat i don't know Mm -hmm. that you you don't hear it in the opening title sequence but you hear a wind sound throughout the movie 
It first plays mm. in the first scene when he sits on the couch, and then you hear it at several other times. I, I clocked it um, when he's getting beaten up by the bookies and then or the thugs, and then yeah. also at the very end when he confronts uh, Bernie. Hmm. There's like this weird yeah. sound of the wind, and to me, it's like I don't know. I don't know what it's, it signifies. It's weird you say that because there was it's supposed to be wind, but it's clearly like an invisible non-wind because it's on <laughs> dry leaves, and the only thing that moves is the hat. There's no, the leaves are completely still, and the only thing that goes well, blowing away. I think away, that. that hat blowing away is his dream that he <laughs> right. talks to Vernon. Right, right. Yeah, no, totally. of course. Like, right. And so, you know, it makes sense that it would be surreal like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's sort of like, a, you know, I think it's... Also, it's hard to blow a hat. That's a lot of wind. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Um, <laughs> and, yeah, okay. Well, I mean, we talked about it a lot, and the hat, you know, is, is the sort of... Like, it's undeniable that that's an important part of it, is that it's um, not just from a plot point, of like following the, the the scope of the plot, but then also as like the Coen brothers in the, like the lexicon of their filmography of like following items instead of characters in a lot of ways, you know, mm -hmm. and like that motif of following of like being obsessed with round things. Um, the next movie is Barton Fink, which, you know, just to set the table on that one, I have a very hard time with. I'm, I'm anxious to watch it again so closely after watching Miller's Crossing. You know, they got writer's block while they were making Miller's Crossing. And so they took a break and literally just busted out writing but Barton Fink during the, in the middle of writing this movie hmm. just to get their heads out of Miller's Crossing. And, and Barton then, Fink is crazy, but it, it, to me it's like kind of more compelling in, in a lot of ways than, than this one was. Um, I, I can't wait to talk to you guys about it. Yeah, I can't wait to actually and see it for the first it. time. So I'll have to yeah, chew it up. It's, it's, it's interesting, yeah. I think it's really relevant today, so it'll be cool to talk about right now. All yeah. I know is Turturro's in it, and that's a thumbs up for me. Yeah. Well, John Goodman's back. Nice. Yahtzee. Yeah, he's the, co he's the co lead. Let's do it. Um, yeah, all right. Sounds great. Anything you guys want to say about it before we sign off? One last little thing. Uh, speaking of like the actual Miller's Crossing place, I you know send you guys photos occasionally, and I was just gonna say how hard it is to shoot in the woods. Like, did they wait for it to be like a cloudy? It has to be cloudy because otherwise, like shooting in the trees is really really yeah, difficult so, to do. So I just saw that <laughs> and went like it must be overcast. Yeah. Did they shoot the whole thing every scene they got at the same time? Really lucky. I read about it. Barry Sonnenfeld incredible job as the cinematographer of this mm -hmm. movie insisted that the leaves be falling in a certain way at this like for that shot like that mm -hmm. you know the miller's crossing scenes are so apart from the rest of the movie mm -hmm. it's lit differently obviously yeah. and it's you know it's um it's like its own and world he insisted yeah he insisted that it be like a specific overcast autumn day mm -hmm. and then you know like they got lucky it was and it okay. stayed that way there's a couple of shots where the you know sun is coming through and they kept him in mm -hmm. and it works for the movie i think but it was mostly like a happy accident or not a happy accident a happy on purpose i don't know what to call it <laughs> yeah they did yeah. their best to get, <laughs> it a, worked, get right. a certain effect yeah. and it worked yeah well i just wanted yeah. to say about the miller's crossing place as well that's another scene that's kind of doubled in the plot and something's very specific happens in miller's crossing where john chaturro you know, faces his like execution and then comes back from it with like uh, the ability to kill now, like added to his like abilities. Right. And mm. the exact same thing happens to Gabriel Byrne. Did we ever, uh, this, right. I know we were Good getting point. way past when we wanted to be over, but because I didn't look this up, do we know who the dead body is that they end up finding it's supposed when to be they Mink. go back to Crossing? So John Turturro, but I'm kills, trying to figure out who killed. So Bernie oh, so kills Mink. Mink. Bernie he, killed like, him. Now, He's okay, sort of like, I missed that. yeah, I think like facing death somehow he is like, has a new will to survive. That's going to allow him to murder that's and like crazy. face that. And then, and the then same he goes back to the same spot. Happens that's to, insane. yeah. And cause he, I, cause I, I knew it was Mink because they, you know, they say that, but uh, later when they realize that it wasn't Bernie, when Eddie Dane realizes that, um, but I didn't know how that, transpired and i didn't even know for sure if it was me because i just missed that part of yeah that. i think he I he mentions that. it when he uh in uh in what's his name's um in tom's apartment when bernie's waiting for him he just kind of discusses like oh, oh yeah okay. you know that was did you like that touch or whatever so anyway looking forward well, to yeah Martin okay Faye. so i'm glad you guys loved it as much as i do and <laughs> <I'm just kidding. laughs> 
Okay. <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, I can't wait to talk to you guys next week. And um, we will see you guys then. Always a pleasure, Sounds guys. Good. Talk to you soon. Thank you for listening to Autour Detour. We'll see you again next week. Okay.